Matthew chapter 19. Hey, are you glad you're saved? Yeah. Amen. We're glad that you're here. And uh, man, we, ought, we ought to be excited about what the Lord has done for us. I think sometimes we don't pause enough to praise him and thank him for all he's done. And boy, I'm sure thankful for saving a little boy and keeping me from a lot of things. And I just, just encourage you to just follow the Lord and do what the Lord wants you to do. And I, I think there might be some young men in here that the Lord could call to preach and use. And, uh, you know, you say, well, I don't, I don't know about that. I'll tell you this, as a little boy, maybe not, I, I got to be careful, but my high school teacher is here. And uh, when I was little, I was kind of painfully shy. And I uh, never thought I'd ever stand before people and preach. I uh, came out of that a little bit in high school and, and gave Mr. Epp all those gray hairs he's got. But I remember at about eight years old, coming out of a church Sunday morning, and my mom said to me, it was, it was kind of a career day at church, and we were actually in Sunday school that day. I remember in our class, I don't know if it was a whole church, but in our class, we were to dress up like we wanted to whatever career we wanted. So whether you wanted to be a fireman or a policeman, you were supposed to do something like that. And so I had a little badge, you know, from, from the toy store that I wore and, and something like that. I wanted to be a, I don't remember if it was fireman or police, whatever it was. And we're, we talked about God's will for our lives as little boys. I was eight years old. And I remember at the end of that service, I walked down one aisle, and my best friend, Greg Whiteside, walked down another aisle, and we surrendered to do whatever the Lord wanted us to do. It was in the basement of 154 Maple Street down there in that dark cellar of a place. But I remember walking that and praying uh, with, with Mr. Art Wiedrich and saying, God, I'll do whatever you want me to do. And so I get in the car, and I was excited about it and tell my mom, and, and she says, well, she says, maybe, maybe God wants you to be the preacher. I said, there's no way I could ever get up and do what Dr. Strachan does. There's no way. And uh, the Lord has a sense of humor. And I just, I just want to encourage some young people tonight that we, I guess it's burdening me a little bit. Brother Paul and I were talking about this afternoon. Where, where's our next wave of preachers coming from? And fellas, if it's not coming from local churches, it's not coming from the right places. And so we need some young men that are willing to step up. And I, and I understand this, guys. I, I know that God doesn't call everybody to preach, but God calls everybody to serve. And there's something you can do for the Lord. And if God called everybody to preach, we wouldn't have any churches to preach to. I, I get that. I understand that. But there's something you can do for the Lord, and that ought to be the primary focus of our lives. And, and, and uh, our jobs and the, the things that we do for our careers are, in a sense, secondary. They provide for our families and take care of those needs, but really they're to enable us to do more for Jesus Christ. And that really ought to be our goal. Listen, you're not, you're not going to be judged when you get to, to heaven about uh, your employment at whatever company you are. You're going to be judged what you did for Christ. And so let's, let's make sure that that is our focus. And I just, just a word of encouragement tonight. And I just pray that there's some young men that God is still raising up because we need some preachers. And uh, I'm, I'm still relatively young, I think. I don't feel it some days. I'm 45, and, you know, I hope I have another 20, 30 years of preaching left. But I know that the funny thing is, is just yesterday, I was starting in ministry, and Brother Connor was 45. And so 20 years goes very quickly, is what I'm trying to say. And so in 20 years, and guys, and guys honestly, if you, if, you, if you surrender today and go off to Bible college, you're 10 years away from pastoring anyway. So we need to start praying and planning ahead now of what God wants us to do. And because we are in desperate need in this country of preachers, men that will hold up the word of God. So look tonight, Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19, that, that had nothing to do with anything, but just that was free. Matthew chapter 19. I just want to read two verses. I mentioned the other day that I love it when I read the Bible and the Lord just causes me to trip over a verse. That's, that's kind of what I call it, just tripping over a verse. And you get stuck there. And these verses in particular, I got stuck on for quite a while. And I mean, to the point where I just couldn't figure out what the Lord was saying, but I knew there was something. And it, it was bothering me for a long time. And you're, you're going to read the verses with me, and you're going to say, you're right, Brother Fear, there's nothing there. And, but I want to share what the Lord did in my heart with these verses, all right? Matthew chapter 19, look at verses 1 and 2. The Bible says, and it came to pass... That when Jesus had finished these sayings, he departed from Galilee and came into the coast of Judea beyond Jordan, and great multitudes followed him 
and he healed them there. All right, read that again with me. Look at it again and see if you see what, and here's the thing. If you see what the Lord showed me after about a week of reading these verses, we'll just pray and we'll be dismissed, all right? So try to, try to get it with me. And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these sayings, he departed from Galilee and came under the coast of Judea beyond Jordan, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. Let's pray together. Father, we are so thankful to be called your children. What a wonderful privilege and a blessing, Lord, that you would call us your own. We understand what that took. It took the blood of Jesus Christ to pay the price for our sins that we might be born into the family of God and also adopted. And what a wonderful privilege it is to have that standing in Christ Jesus. So I want to thank you tonight and tell you I love you. It's overwhelming to know how much you loved us. Father, I just pray, Lord, that for the next few moments that you would help me, fill me, use me, and allow me to preach that the thing I was tripping over, the thing you laid upon my heart. And so, Lord, I pray, Lord, that it would help us tonight, that each one would receive something from the word of God that strengthened them and blessed them and challenge them and convict them if needed. But Lord, whatever you have for us tonight, we pray most importantly that you'd receive the glory for it, that our hearts would be turned towards thee. And Father, we love you, we thank you, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Matthew chapter 19 is a transitional time in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. He, he's just been preaching and teaching around the areas of Galilee and he's about to leave and to come into the place of Judea. And unlike some of Jesus' other trips, he would take a different route than he had in the past. In John chapter 4, we read that Jesus said, I must needs go through Samaria. That was unusual to the disciples. And at this point in time, in Matthew chapter 19, we will find that Jesus will take the customary route, and I'll show you the language there that suggests that in just a moment. But Jesus would take the customary route and leave from the northern regions of Galilee. In particular, we learn in Matthew chapter 18 that he was in Capernaum, and he would head south, and he would arrive in Judea. And the Bible says that well, great multitudes followed Jesus, and he healed them there. It's interesting to me that as I read this passage of scripture and the multitudes that followed him, I, I begin to consider why were they following Jesus? Well, I want to suggest to you tonight, and, I, and, and it's nothing to you that our children of God here tonight to understand this, they had, they had some good reasons to follow Jesus. But if we look back just a chapter, he's talking specifically about people from the area of Galilee, in particular in Matthew 18, people that were living in Capernaum, and they were the ones that followed on this trip and began to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you'll flip back to Matthew chapter 18, you'll learn some things. And I'm not going to read the book, but we will just quickly highlight some things. In verses 1 through 6, you'll see that Jesus Christ preached on humility. He talked about the little children, and unless we become like a child and accept the Lord Jesus Christ, and there's humility in that thing, because the Bible says that it was after these things. The Bible says that when Jesus, in verse 19, chapter 19, verse 1, had finished these sayings, and so there was something about his preaching and something about his message that attracted people to Jesus Christ. And so his message, first of all, was one of humility, but secondly, it was one of holiness. In verses 7 through 9, he said, if, if thy I offend thee, pluck thee out, and if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It's better to enter into hell maimed and blind than it is, or into heaven maimed and blind than it is to be cast into hell. And he's preaching on holiness there. And so his message was resonating with people. And the Bible says that people, after he'd finished these sayings, began to follow him. 
He preached about humility and he preached about holiness. In verses 10 through 14, he preached about a concern for the lost. He, he says that Jesus, the Son of Man, has come to save that which was lost. And I, I imagine people that were there and under this Roman rule and under Pharisee oppression, they were glad to hear that somebody loved them. That Jesus Christ had come to seek out them. And so Jesus in Matthew 18 just continues to preach about humility and holiness and his concern for them. And then in verses 15 through 20, we often call it church discipline, but I like to call it the restoration of the fallen. Jesus said, I love people. As a matter of fact, if you read on past that, the Bible says, in, uh, if, if you look with me in verse 21, it says, Jesus saith unto him, I am not unto thee, uh, or sorry, verse 20, yeah, 21. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him till seven times? And Jesus answered, saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until 70 times seven. And the rest of the chapter, Jesus preaches on forgiveness. They had some good reasons to follow Jesus. One, I believe, was his message. Secondly, I believe they followed Jesus because they were attracted to him because of his methods. In verses 10 through 14 of chapter 18, if we can remind ourselves, Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus just simply loved people. I don't say this to be disrespectful in any way, and please don't take it that way. But if Jesus were to walk through that door tonight, I believe that within just a short matter of time, every one of us would want to be his friend. We would find in him a love and a compassion that is unparalleled. I, again, I don't mean to be disrespectful. I think that, and, and I don't mean this in a, in a dirty way or a perverted way, I, I believe that every one of our wives and daughters and, and females of our church would find in him perfect love. They would be drawn to him. I don't mean that in an untoward way at all. I just mean that Jesus loved people. And when people are hurting and oppressed like they, the Jews were in the first century, they appreciated people that loved them. I appreciate people that love me. I, 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 one of my favorite old hymns, and it, it's I'll fly, no, not I'll fly. <laughs> I am so glad that my Father in heaven tells of his love in a book he has written. Wonderful things in the Bible I see, but this is the dearest. Jesus loves me. Man, I love that. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Sing it. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. And they had a good reason to follow Jesus, didn't they? Some were attracted because of his message. I believe all were attracted because of his methods. He just simply loved people. Some were attracted because of his miracles. It was in Capernaum that we, we see that those four men took the roof off a house and lowered that bed down and Jesus healed the man that was lame from his birth. It was there that he healed Peter's mother-in-law of a fever. He healed a centurion ser uh, servant. He cast out an unclean spirit from the man in the synagogue. As a matter of fact, I, the Bible teaches us that many that were following Jesus, the Bible says when they came into the coast of Judea, he healed them there. So they too were looking for a miracle from God. There was a great reason to follow Jesus Christ, his message and his methods that were love and his miracles. And there's great reason. Let me ask you this. Do you remember why you first followed Jesus? What is it that drew you to him? For me, it was just a simple gospel message that I was lost and dying and on my way to hell. And as a little boy, I somehow came to that realization and I understood that Jesus took my place. And if I would just trust him as my Lord and Savior, he would gladly pay the price for my sin on a cross called Calvary. And he would shed his blood to wash away all my sins. But it wasn't enough just to believe. I also had to receive it into my heart. And so I trusted Jesus Christ and he paid the price for my sin. And friends, that was good enough for me. I was so thankful for what Jesus did for me. And, I, and listen, I'm going to be honest with you, I've never gotten over it. 
I'm more excited today that I'm saved than I ever was when I was five years old. At five years old, I lacked understanding in a lot of things what Christ did. But I'm here to tell you that I love the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm not ashamed to say that Jesus is precious to me, and I hope he's precious to you. We have good reasons for following Jesus. I would wonder tonight if there isn't somebody in this room that says, you know, I started following Jesus because I started going to a church and they helped restore my marriage. Boy, I found Jesus to be real and precious. I saw what the youth group did for one of my teenage kids. Boy, that, that boy changed when he started coming back from teens. And I knew that God had done something in his life, and so I, I went and I trusted Christ. We were thankful. I, I don't know if I've told you this, but just a couple weeks ago on Easter Sunday, we had a, an atheist, 63-year-old atheist, come to church just to spite his wife. And he walked the aisle and accepted Christ as his Savior. The following Saturday, he brought his wife to Tim Horton and said, Pastor, she needs to get saved. Can you help me? And, I, and I, I, I witnessed for an hour and a half to her, and she keep changing the subject to other Bible questions and other things that were important to her. And, and she wasn't opposed to the message, but she sure didn't like that, that personal part, that part about taking Christ personally and, and, and trusting Jesus Christ as her Savior. She just said, I've always believed. And her husband kept leaning over. He says, but you need to say the sinner's prayer. Only saved a week. I finally said to her, I said, ma'am, I said, I can't leave without asking you this. Are you going to trust what you have believed for these last several years about Jesus Christ? Do you think that's good enough to get you into heaven? Or do you need to bow your head and trust Jesus Christ once and for all right now? And she stared at me for 20 seconds. And she says, I'm not saved. I need to trust Christ right now. Praise the Lord, what a wonderful thing to see an atheist lead his, his wife to the Lord and, and sit there and, uh, for 63 years, an atheist, and saved a week and telling his, his wife about the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that lady came to Jesus and she said this to me, I've seen such a change in him this week. And she says, I came this morning, he was supposed to come alone. She was mad about him coming to church. She said, I've seen such a change, I just had to come and find out about this. Well, I don't know what your reason was initially for coming to Jesus Christ. But let me tell you, it's a good one. There's, there's no bad reason to come to Jesus Christ. Jesus loves us so much that he, sent his, that he died on a cross for us. And friends, if you know Jesus as your Savior tonight, you've got a good reason to follow him. But I want you to notice something else about these people in Matthew 19. And if you will indulge me, read those verses again to refresh where we're at. It says, and it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these sayings, he departed from Galilee and came onto the coast of Judea. Now look at the next two words. They're important. Beyond Jordan. The Bible says he healed them there. The typical way to travel from the northern parts of Galilee down into Judea was not what Jesus did in, Matthew cha or in John chapter 4. In John chapter 4, it was noted that Jesus said, I must needs go through Samaria. And we know that he met the woman there at Jacob's well. And it was there that he led the Samaritan woman to, to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And it was there that she left her water pot and went back into the city and told everybody about this man that she met. Is this not the Messiah? Jesus had a special appointment with him, with her. The disciples, you'll remember in John chapter 4, when they came back, they said, in their hearts, but not out loud to Jesus, boy, that would have been trouble. What is he doing talking to this woman? If I can just be so bold to say this, they were just a bunch of racists. They didn't think that a Jew should talk to a Samaritan. It was a cultural problem. And that Jesus would lower himself and humble himself to talk to this Samaritan woman was beneath him. Friends, we can learn something here. Jesus Christ doesn't care about color, creed, nothing. Amen. For God so loved the world. And we have to get past those prejudices and those things. I mean, that has nothing to do with this message. But we need to get past this stuff or we're going to be effective witnesses for Jesus Christ. And I, I'm going to be honest, I'm probably preaching more to myself. You guys are very multicultural around Vancouver area and, and BC, but in small town Simcoe, 
I'm talk- I-, I went to school, I went to school at Port Dover Public School, 800 students as a child, and only one black person in the whole school. That's the kind of area I grew up in. And so we really, we, we had one black family in the church, the Harrison family, and a church of maybe four or 500 back then. And, and so we need to do a better job reaching those people. We have, in the summertime now, we have, we have offshore workers, like you wouldn't believe, thousands of Mexican Mennonites and thousands of people from Bermuda and Jamaica and Bahamas that come up and pick apples and peaches and things throughout the summer. But we need to do a better job reaching these people for Christ. But those disciples had a real problem with that. But Jesus said, I need to go through Samaria. Now notice the trip he took this time. The Bible says he left the regions of Galilee and he came into Judea and the Bible says beyond Jordan. What the scripture is referring to there is that the Lord Jesus Christ would have taken the typical route for Jews and when he leaves Galilee, he would travel directly east across the Jordan River, head south 70 miles past Samaria and then travel west back into Judea just to avoid the Samaritans, just to stay away from these unclean people, these half-breeds. And so the Lord Jesus Christ uh, took these people on this trip. And I, I want you to notice some things about the effort that they made to follow Jesus. And I want you, first of all, consider their dedication. This was not an easy trip. If we read Matthew 19, verses 1 and 2, we at first glance say, well, okay, some people got saved and they got excited and others were, had some needs, they had some healing they needed and they needed a miracle, so they followed Jesus to the next little town. No, 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 no. They went east across a river. They traveled 70 miles, not by sky train, but by foot. And then they crossed the Jordan River again and settled in Judea, and the Bible says he healed them there. And what I want to impress upon your hearts tonight is this, is that it took some dedication. It took some sacrifice. I, I want you to think about this with me as we consider the dedication and consider the distance and, and we consider the danger of this journey, and we understand that maybe there was a, a young man that had come to the Lord Jesus Christ and, and, and accepted him as his Savior and put his faith in Jesus Christ and went home all excited. He said to his mom and dad, listen, I met the Messiah today. I met Jesus Christ, and I, and I believe he's the Son of God, and I believe he was sent to, to free me from my sins, and so I've put my faith and trust in him and I'm going to follow him all my life. And maybe his parents said, I don't think so, buddy. You're losing your mind. We know the Messiah is coming, but this Jesus character, that's not him. And that young boy said, well, I've got to step up by faith and I've got to follow Jesus. And so he joins the multitudes. I wonder if there's a, a, a fellow in that group that went home to his wife and said, guess what? I, I got saved today. And this man that I met, his name is Jesus, and he is the Christ. He's the Messiah. He's the one that that prophet John was preaching about over there by Jordan. And he said, I, I tell you, he does miracles. Maybe she said to him, I tell you what, if you start following him, don't you come back here. Maybe there were some folks that, you know, sometimes we don't think about people in the first century that they had jobs and things like that, but you know people had to work, right? The Bible says a man won't work, he shouldn't eat, so there must be jobs. But maybe somebody went to his boss and, and said, you know what, I'm going on this trip. How, how long does it take you to walk 70 miles? Anybody know? I'm not going to try it, so you're not going to find out from me. 70 miles. Round trip is 140. Plus crossing the river twice. How long does that take? Can you do 20 miles a day by foot? I I would suggest to you that with this caravan of this size, it probably was a week's journey to get down to the south. And if they stayed there for any length of time, and then another week's journey home, and maybe some fellow would go to his boss and say, hey, listen, I need a couple weeks off work. Maybe three. 
Jesus is going on this journey. Well, where are you going? I really don't know. What, you going to Jerusalem? I don't know. I just know that he's leaving and I'm going with him. And, well, you, you're not going to have a job when you come back. I'm just saying that of this multitude, I have to, I have to assume, I, I, and I'll admit that, I'm assuming. But these people made some sacrifices. Would you agree with that? This was not going to be an easy journey. This was not going to be something that would be well accepted by all their friends and all their family and all their co-workers. There was a lot of people that rejected the Lord Jesus Christ and there was a lot of people that were upset when Jesus Christ would do anything. There were those that tried to throw him off a mountain cliff and he just walked away. There was others that conspired. You know, here's one of my favorite verses in the Bible because it makes me laugh. It's when it talks about the Pharisees getting up real early in the morning trying to figure out how to take them by craft. Let me ask you this. How early in the morning do you got to get up to sneak up on the Son of God? Bunch of fools. Man, that makes me laugh. I kick my feet up in the air and giggle every time I read it. What, what a hilarious, hilarious scripture. But they wanted him dead. They were conspiring against him. And there would be some in that crowd whose loved ones and friends would say, don't go with Jesus. The Pharisees want to kill him. The Sadducees want to crucify him. The chief priests, they, they're conspiring every day. They're coming door to door and they're saying, have you seen him? Do you know where he is? Where can we find him? Don't you go with Jesus. But they sacrificed and they went. Now I want you to notice some principles here this evening. I, I, I understand that we live in a country that we have freedom, and praise the Lord for it. And our idea of persecution is when somebody gets upset because we give them a gospel track. Well, you won't believe what they said to me. They called me a holy roller. Really? Do you know in the book of Acts, they rejoiced and praised God that they were found worthy to suffer for his name? Peter was told by Jesus Christ, you're going to die if you feed my sheep. And so I understand that we live in a different culture. But there may be some here tonight who said, you know what, preacher, I did have to sacrifice. I had family, and, and where we are, we are seeing more and more down, just about 60 miles down the road from us, we have a little town called Elmer, Ontario. Elmer, Ontario is home to old colony Mennonites. And as the farms in our community, in Norfolk County, only the big farms are surviving. All the little farms are, are dying out. They can't, they can't make enough money to survive. And so dads are having to go get jobs in the cities and things like that. And these Mennonite folks are coming and buying up all those little farms. Because they can live off 60 acres. They, they share and they work together and they all live in the same house and they can live off 60 acres because they just feed themselves. They're not worried about making a million dollars. And so they, they buy up all these little farms and we started having these folks getting saved, trusting Christ. But they won't get baptized for a long time usually. I remember Helena Tykro, but she came to the church and her mother Maria was with her and Maria accepted Jesus Christ as her savior and, and she said this to me. She says, I called my family and I told them that I accepted Jesus Christ as my savior. She says, I have 17 brothers and sisters. Only one is talking to me now. She says, Maria accepted Christ, but she's hesitant to tell anybody because she doesn't think she'll have any friends left in the world. Her son Herman recently accepted Christ as Savior, and the day he got baptized, his uncle called him and he said, you're no longer part of our family. Hilda Dyke came to our church, accepted Jesus Christ as her Savior, and I said, Hilda, the first thing we need to do is baptize you as a profession of your faith in Jesus Christ. And she says, Pastor, can we, I'm happy to do that, but can we please not live stream it? My mom and dad live in Alberta. They'll never talk to me again if they find out I've been baptized. We have the Weens family that just started coming, Henry and Helen Weens. And about a month ago, they sat at my dinner table on a Friday night and both prayed the sinner's prayer and accepted Christ as Savior. 
And Helen says, I'm, I'm ready to get baptized right now, but my husband knows he'll never see his family again. And maybe you're in that boat where you have to make a real sacrifice to follow Christ. And that you have to make some hard decisions. But of that multitude, I, I want to suggest to you tonight that of the multitude that follow Jesus Christ, how many is multitude? I know it's a lot of people. Of that multitude, many of them made some sacrifices. Now, I want to illustrate something to you tonight. I, I need help from guys. Stand up if you are 25 or younger. 25 years old or younger. Please stand up. All right, let's see. How many do we got? 30 and younger. If you're under 30, stand up. I need a few more. All right, all you guys come right up over here. Come up in this corner, all right? All you guys over here. How many of you glad you're over 30? <laughs> Amen. All right, Brother Lenvoy, you come too. No. <laughs> all right, come on up here, guys. I need help. All right. How many of you say, I, I'd be okay being embarrassed up here if I was under 30? Hey, Amen. I'd like a few years back. All right, here's the multitude. Looks more like a rabble. But here they are, a motley crew. And each one of them have made a decision to follow Christ. Each one of them have a good reason to follow Jesus Christ. And each one of them have made a sacrifice to follow Jesus Christ. And they left behind home jobs. And they've left behind family. And they've, they've left uh, behind some, uh, some, their homes. And they've just closed up the doors and said, we're going to go and follow Jesus. Now let me illustrate what I think happened. And I, I'm going to be very careful here. I believe we ought to preach the Bible. And so if I'm going to illustrate something. I'm just going to be honest with you and tell you, here's what I'm illustrating, what I think might have happened, and I base this on human nature, all right? So they leave Galilee, and they, and they, all, they all have needs. The Bible says that when they got there, Jesus healed them, all right? And so this fellow over here, he's got leprosy, and this fellow over here, he's got a withered hand, and this fellow over here, he's blind, this fellow here, he's mentally handicapped. <laughs> just too easy, isn't it? <laughs> and so they all desire something from Jesus. And they begin to walk. And they come the first day. And guys, just kind of straighten out a little bit. Why don't you just straighten out right across the front here. And they begin to walk and they get to the river Jordan. And the waters are high and dangerous. And somebody at the back of the line says, you know what? This isn't what I bargained for. I thought Jesus was going to keep preaching and keep healing. Do you know the Bible says in verse 2 of chapter 19, he healed them there. He didn't heal them along the route. He didn't take time out to, at the campfire in the evening to say, well, listen, fellas, I'm glad you've come this far. Let's, let's see who needs help tonight and healed a few people. He said, all right, I'm, I'm going to save some of that for tomorrow. No, he, he said, let's see who's dedicated. Let's see who's willing to go a little bit further. Let's see who's willing to sacrifice. And I would suspect, just because of human nature, that this fellow right back here said, you know what, my wife told me that if I leave, and I don't supply for my family, and I'm not going to take care of them, she's going to go back to her father's house. And these thoughts are, how many of you know the devil likes to put those thoughts in your head? And those thoughts are plaguing him as he's walking in the quiet. They're crossing that river and he says, you know what? Maybe I should go home. You can go sit down, brother. Right there. You're, you're quick and easy and out. Maybe, maybe I should go home and I will talk to my wife and I'll try to make sure she hasn't left yet. But boy, this sacrifice is a little bit too much. Maybe another guy got thinking about the practicality of this trip, and he said, you know what? He says, I left a pretty good paying job, and I've stepped out, and I'm following Jesus, but now we've been walking for two days, and we've come 40 miles, and we're a long way from home, and nothing's happened. Jesus hasn't spoke. He hasn't healed anybody. What is going on? Why? I thought he was the great healer, and I thought I had some good reasons to follow him, but doesn't the Bible say several times that the disciples turned back and followed him no more. And so maybe these two fellows said, I'm, I'm going back and beg my job from my boss again. And so they returned home. 
And then another drops off. And another drops off. And they all have good reasons. And I'm not being funny, so please, I'm not trying to embarrass you. But maybe there's some young married couples. We don't have any ladies here, so I'm just going to have to improvise. There's some young married couples and thought, we've got little children with us. And this is dangerous. And if we've crossed the river once, we might cross into Judea. Then we're going to have to cross it twice more to go home. And what are we doing out here in the desert? Maybe we better put our family first. And so maybe they went home. You two can go have a seat. Thank you. And the Bible says this, when they got to Judea, Jesus finally stops and turns around and he healed them there. Now, the Bible doesn't say this, and I I get that, and I'm not trying to deceive you or lead you anywhere you shouldn't be. But just by, and help me out tonight, please raise your hands, I won't call you Pentecostal. How many of you think that some might have turned back? I mean, just human nature, right? Some of their decisions, how many of you know you've gone to the church before and you've made an emotional decision? That you've just got all wrapped up in some, some music program and some preacher and you've got excited about the message. And, and I'm not saying he set out to deceive anybody. I'm not saying the music was wrong. I'm just saying in that moment you got hyped up and you got excited and you made a decision based on your emotions rather than the facts of scripture and you stepped out to do something and then the next day you went, well, what have I done here? What am I doing? A lot of people do that. And they, they show their lack of commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ and they're not willing to sacrifice for the Lord Jesus Christ. And here's the thing. All those guys that went home, they missed out on the healing. They missed out on the blessing of God. They didn't see it through to the end. They were not found faithful. And so when God decided to reach out and start touching and healing and working in people's lives... They all missed out. You guys may be seated. Thank you. Now, listen, listen to this. You see all those guys going home? You see all those guys going home? What happens when they get home? And the buddy that went home a week ago sees them in the marketplace and he starts laughing at them. Ah, you fools. I smartened up a long time ago. And I came up, what did you find with that? Jesus, he didn't help you at all, did he? He says, oh, wait. My hand is healed. My eyes can see. My leprosy is gone. I, I mean, I'm kicking my heels up like never before. And Jesus, in fact, healed us when we got there. But you missed out because you gave up on Jesus. Here's a principle for you tonight, and I'll be done. You say, what does this have to do with me? And I want to speak to the church members right now, not the pastors, all right? So pastors, don't listen for a minute. Fellas, your church needs faithful men, all right? Be a church pillar, not a church caterpillar. Your pastor needs faithful men. And here's what I mean, and here's the application. God has given your pastor a vision for your church. I don't know what it is. He may not know what it is right now incomplete. He may have an idea where he wants to go tomorrow, next week, next month. But God's going to give him something as he goes. Why? Because he's the pastor. He's the man of God. He's the shepherd who leads the sheep. But I'm going to promise you this. He's going to make a decision, and you're going to say, I don't think that's right for this church. And if we have the wrong attitude, we'll stomp our feet, and we'll turn around, and we'll go home. And when your church gets to where it's supposed to be going under the will of God, you're going to be real disappointed you missed out on what God's going to do. I can promise you that a hundred times over. 
About three years ago, a gentleman was coming to our church. As a matter of fact, I grew up with him. His father, my uncle, stood up with Bob Stone, who is Pastor Al Stone's father, in, the, in his wedding. I grew up with this young man. We'd gone to school together. His dad and my uncle were best friends. We played basketball together in high school. We, were, we went to other high schools and played against their teams, and we had a good time. And, but at the time, he didn't know Christ as his Savior. And some long where along the road, he accepted Jesus as his Savior, and he was going to a, a liberal type of church. And, and just in his spiritual growth, he began to grow and grow and grow until he got to a point where he was fundamental Baptist in King James. Then he started coming to our church. And he came for about two years he got upset about something. And he came to me, he says, Pastor, he says, I, I, I don't like what's happening here. He says, I think we should do it this way. And I said, I said I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I said, I, I understand tradition doesn't matter. We're going to be biblical. Tradition doesn't matter. But I said, if I can just put it this way to help you understand, Bethel is 85 years old and we've done it that way for 85 years. And I don't mean to be offensive, and I'm not saying tradition is the most important thing at all, but I'm here to say that if you've only come to church for six months, don't think you're going to change an 85-year-old tradition. I said, Jim, you joined us, we didn't join you. And he says, well, he says, I appreciate your candor, but I'm going to have to take my family somewhere else. And I said, that's fine. And I wasn't happy about it, but he left. Last year, in March, just shortly after they left the church, they left in about November, of two, a year and a half ago, and just in March, we, we had our spring revival meeting, we have one every year, and we have a quartet comes and an evangelist preaches, and if you're from, who's from Anchor Baptist Church? Brother Calvin Allen just preached for you. And Brother Allen preached for us, and God did something on our two, last night of the revival, and the Monday night, the second last night, my son accepted Christ about one in the morning. The next morning, a young lady got saved. We had three more in the school chapel get saved. That night, my son asked if he could give a testimony before church started. He got up and he preached for about 15 minutes and people started getting up and going to the altar. Then the quartet started singing and more people came and a lady that had been a member of the church for 40 years came and found me in the scene. She says, Pastor, I got to get saved. And, and long story short, we had... 13 people saved that night. We baptized seven right after the service. I baptized seven more the following Sunday. And in eight weeks, we baptized 32 and added them to the church. And all 32 are still coming today. I, I'll brag on that all day, not because I did a thing. I sat in the pew. God did something. And God continued to revive our church throughout the year and then they came back again, and just two weeks ago, we had them again, and God did something different this year, and we, we saw one or two saved during the revival, but here's what we saw. We saw people in the church get revived and go out and start winning souls that hadn't won souls in 30 years. Brother Rob Judge, Jeff, that you grew up with, has won six people to Christ in the last three weeks. Co-workers, men that worked for him for years and watched him as he treated them and, and how he behaved before them. And, and uh, we, we had just a wonderful story yesterday. I was with Brother Connor. We were driving in and Brother Davis and, and John Mark. And I, I stopped and I said, listen, I just got an email from Brother Judge. There's a fellow in his, that works for him, Chris Laddie, and he's an electrician and he works for Judge Farms. And I said, whenever we need an electrician in the church, I call him in because he's very tender and we try to witness to him. I said his son uh, or his nephew is, is in the RCMP Academy and he's exactly one year to the day behind, behind my son. Same troop number, same graduating class one year later. And I said, so we, we're talking about that all the time and what to expect and what's happening next week. And I said, he's very tender to the gospel. And just the other day, Rob sat down with him finally and said, Chris, he says, we've witnessed you a hundred times. We've told you about Jesus. You've come to our Christmas cantata. You've come to our resurrection cantata. He says, I, I just got to nail this down. Do you know Jesus? And, and can we help you know Jesus? And Chris stood up and was weeping and walked out of the office and slammed the door. 
Well, that didn't discourage Rob. He emailed and he says, Chris is going to get saved tonight. Would you pray? <laughs> That's good. Yesterday morning, Chris came back in and he walked into his office and he closed the door and he says, can I talk to you? And Rob thought he was going to apologize for slamming his door because he didn't think at that moment, it just didn't seem his spirit was right at that moment. And he sat down and he says, I went home and I told my wife about Jesus. He says, could we meet with you and your wife on Friday night, tonight? He says, we think it'd be important important if we pray and ask Jesus to save us together as a family. I just want to have a shouting fit. And so I expect, I haven't heard yet, my phone's back there, that Chris and Lori Laddie accepted Jesus Christ as Savior tonight. Can I tell you this? I think Chris, I think Chris got saved the other day. I think the prayer tonight is just a formality. Because he went out and won somebody else to Jesus. In all of these things that are going on that God is doing at Bethel Baptist Church, souls being saved and things happening, and guess who called me this week? It was Jim who left a year and a half ago. He said, Pastor, I was wrong. He says, I'm seeing souls saved, and I'm running into people from the church, and they're saying, oh, you should have never left. What a sweet spirit, and you should see what God is doing, and God is saving souls. And he even said, he says, I, Pastor, he says I'm going to be honest, honest with you, Pastor, I said this. He says, I told one person that I ran into last week, I don't think God would use Al Fury for that. And my friend wisely said, God didn't use Al Fury, God did it. That doesn't offend me because I want God to do it. But Jim called me and says, can we come back? We're missing out on something. We see the spirit of God is working and we want to be there. We want to be a part of that. And I'm sorry, pastor. Guys, listen. God has given your pastor a vision. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Christ. And some of you are going to say, well, I don't like his leadership and I don't like the decisions he's making and I don't like the direction the church is going. Listen, if he is loving God and he is reading his Bible and he is praying and he is preaching filled with the Holy Spirit of God, you keep following and you keep being faithful because I'm going to tell you this, you're going to regret it one day if you give up too soon. You are going to miss the blessing of God. Hey, isn't that what we're looking for? The moving of God. I'll illustrate with this and I'm done. In 1992, I joined a little church called Hillside Baptist Church in Springfield, Missouri. A little country church out in the middle of nowhere. I had gone to a bigger church in town and I'll be honest with you, I wasn't being fulfilled there because it was my fault. I got involved in Awanas, bus ministry. I got involved in every ministry I could, thinking that's what a Bible college student is supposed to do, and I was never in church getting any preaching. So I burnt myself out. And one night, this little church, uh, a, 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 a son of a, a friend of mine, uh, uh, Brother Mike Dorman, that we were just talking about a few minutes ago, his son had accepted Christ, and he was going to baptize him that night. So my wife and I, my, Brother Mike had been her youth pastor, we went out to this church to see the boy baptized on a Sunday night, and we fell in love with the church and the people. Little church ran about 80 people. One of the finest men that I knew was a fellow by the name of D. Arnell. D. Arnell, his best Sunday going to church clothes was he would iron his overalls. We're talking the Ozark Mountains here, all right? He would iron his overalls for Sunday church. That was the best he owned. But let me tell you this, there wasn't a five-year-old in that church that graduated from kindergarten at the public school that he wasn't there sitting in the back row cheering that kid on. Those people knew how to love one another. And when we loved that church, and we went to that church, and one night I went out with the pastor 
on, on visitation night, and we were going out to uh, visit some folks that had recently come to church, and he wanted to share the gospel with them. And I'm, I'm, don't get me wrong, I'm a 19-year-old, snot-nosed kid. I didn't know a thing about anything, but my pastor was discouraged. He'd been there, he'd been there at that time for about eight years. And he said, I'm, Brother Fury says, I, I just don't know what God wants to do here. He says, I'm sorry, you've been there six years. I've been here six years. And he says, the first year we averaged about 80 people. The next year we averaged about 81. The next year we averaged about 79. The next year about 80. He says, long story short, over six years, he said, we haven't budged. He says, and, I, and I'm trying. He says, I'm knocking on doors and I'm, I'm preaching as best I can. And he says, I'm praying and I'm asking God to use me. And he says, I just, I just and he was the most humble pastor uh, that I ever met. And he just sincerely wanted to see God do something. And he began to tell me about the history of the church. He says, you know, the church is only 12 years old. He says, we started in 1980 and it's 1992. He says, I'm the seventh pastor and I've been here six years. He says the first six years, he says, we had uh, six different pastors. One only stayed for three weeks. He said, but nobody more than two years was the maximum. Some just for months. And I'm a dumb teenage kid that didn't know any better. And I'm just trying to encourage my pastor. And I said, pastor, I said, maybe God just wants to see if you're going to stick it out and be faithful. And he went, yeah, maybe. 1993, the church went from 80 to 160 in one year. And we started a building program. And before I left, I, I got to see them pour the new foundation. And I, I, I got to help tear down the old vestibule where we we're going to join up the new auditorium. And it was exciting. And two years later, in 1996, my wife and I went down to Lubbock, Texas to see, uh, to see her family. And uh, as we were going through, keep in mind, the church has only been completed and occupied for 14 months at this time. And we walk in the door, and they're putting chairs out in the aisles. He said, Brother Fear, he says, our opening Sunday, he says, every pew was full. He says, we haven't even paid for this thing yet. I don't know what we're going to do. He says, we've actually, he says, we got some chairs. He says, as soon as, as church starts, he says, my ushers will put a bunch of chairs out in the lobby. And he says, people will come and sit there. He says, they're just waiting to sit. They're just mingling right now. He says, we, we have seating for 220. And he says, we're running 280 and 290 every week. Three years after that, I went back, going to Texas again, and we stopped in, and he walked me through the foundation that had been poured for a 580-seat auditorium. Praise the Lord, Pastor Tolbert's still there today, all these years later. And in a church that has 580 seats, he's running 700 on average. In this little country church out in the middle of nowhere that you couldn't, you, you know the three most important things in church planning, location, 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 they threw that out the window. They said the most important thing is we're going to preach in the spirit of God and we're going to obey God and we're going to follow God and we're going to trust God. And I'm going to tell you this, there was a lot of people when that church was running 80 that came and went and left and they're going, oh man, look what God has done now. They went to the big flashy churches in the city and as far as I'm concerned, the best church to attend when you're in Springfield, Missouri is Hillside Baptist Church out on West Chestnut Highway 266. Still standing on the word of God, running 700 every single week in the middle of nowhere, full of farmers that love Jesus and love people. Pastor Tolbert said this, the last time I was there was about four years ago on my way home from Lubbock, Texas. He said, Brother Fury." I'm sure glad I didn't quit. He says, look what God has done. I am so glad I didn't quit. Let's pray together.